Well, welcome everyone to the Wealthy Speaker Podcast. I'm your host, Jane Atkinson. Today, I'd like to talk to you about building the business of your dreams. We have the amazing Dan Miller with us. Welcome, Dan Miller. Thank you so much, Jane. I'm looking forward to our conversation as always. I find your voice very soothing, Dan. I'm so happy to have you back on the show. Now, we wanted to get this discussion going with you because your book is called 48 Days to the Work You Love. Brilliant title. It's worked. Tell us the premise of this book. What does it really mean, the work you love? What it means is the core concept is simply look internally first. Mm -hmm. See, you know, how has God uniquely gifted you? And then what could that look like on Monday morning in terms of work that is meaning, purpose, meaningful, purposeful, and profitable? Mm -hmm. So many people look just at external circumstances. Gee, you know, Uncle Harry made a lot of money working in a coal mine. I guess I'll do that. They yeah. look or they have parental expectations. Gee, Daddy was a doctor, so I guess I need to be one. Mama was a nurse. I need to be. And so they look at external things, and all of a sudden, then they knock on my door when they're 45 years old and say, I think I'm living somebody else's dream, not my own. Yes. That's the problem. So common, isn't that? It that is. We just kind of almost get into the, the river of life and we don't ever think to balk the current. We just go with the flow and then all of a sudden you wake up and you're 50 years old and you're not happy. And I would suspect that many of our listeners who are professional speakers have evaluated and reevaluated yourself included over the past well three years for sure with covid but for you it goes back just a little bit further talk about what happened four years ago in your business you were bringing large groups to you down in tennessee and tell us about that business model what it looked like and then let's hear what's going on in your world today yeah, absolutely. And what I'm going to share just reminds me again, and all of us that we can't get just complacent in what we're doing. Change is going to occur, whether we initiate it, or it comes from another source. Mm -hmm. So we had a beautiful place in Tennessee. And we had on our property, this old barn that we had converted, and we called it the sanctuary. And we had in there space for 60 people, we really packed them in shoulder to shoulder, and then guest quarters in my office were in this old barn. So we had events there, uh, coaching with excellence, right to the bank, innovate, teaching people how to take ideas and really turn them into reality. Had been doing that for 12 years there. And then there was a wonderful article that appeared on the front page of the Nashville, Tennessee, and on a Sunday, and it showed this beautiful place we had and how I had turned it into a retreat center. Somebody in our county saw that and said, you can't do that. You are not zoned to have live public events on your property. They came out and I mean, the codes director was extremely harsh. His recommendation was that we bulldoze the building because not only was it not zoned our property for events, but the building wasn't properly permitted to have people in it either. Oh, so wow. it started this chain of events that really changed how we were doing business right. because those events were very profitable for me. And all of a sudden, we couldn't do them at all. So what we started doing was immediately started looking for what could we do that would still allow people to get together, if not in the same room, at least some kind of connection where we could share ideas and resources, encourage each other, cheer each other on. And we started an online community. Wow. So that was in that was in 2018. We started that. Well, guess what happened two years later? Uh -huh. All of a sudden, COVID hit. Yeah. And in February of 2020, everybody that had live events scheduled was told in one way or another, you can't do this anymore. We were perfectly positioned for that. So what had seemed to be just a really frustrating experience turned out to cause us to explore some options ahead of the game. So we really benefited from that whole surge because it was clear then two years ago, so many people were looking for connection points. And so our online community really thrived and it continues to do so. Oh, that's so beautiful. Now, I want to just back up a step or two further because you came to me at one point for 
one of my masterminds thinking that, hey, I want to get out and speak and travel and get all over the place. And halfway or three quarters of the way through, you actually changed your mind and said, hey, wait a second. <laughs> That's actually not what I want. Talk us through that. Do you remember that? I certainly do <laughs> remember like it was yesterday because, yes, I had had some success in speaking engagements requests. And so I thought I'm really going to ramp this up. I mean, easy peasy, just go around the country and stand up and talk and get paid for it. How cool is that? Mm -hmm. And I discovered real quickly in the process, I really liked being on our farm there in Tennessee. I didn't enjoy airports and hotels, but what you helped me do, and it's still your model to, you know, get clarity, choose your lane, you know, that ready, aim, fire that you yeah. are so good at. It did that. But what I did was discover that I could share my message in multiple ways, not just being on a stage. Now there again, that preparation prepared me well for this last three years that we've had, where a whole lot of people were challenged if that was the focus of their business model, as you know, well, better than I. Right. But I simply took my message. I said, okay, I know what my message is. I have a core message. But I can do that in ways, speaking is one of them, and it still is, but I can also have an online community. I can have a mastermind. I can write and create content there. I can do coaching in multiple forms. Um, I can consult with businesses and where most of that is done virtually. So it's been those things that I have crafted and put together with a Venn diagram of those things that fit together really well. Mm. And it's always evolving. I mean, I, I love that as an entrepreneur. I love that. I don't want to find one thing that works and expect to do it, you know, for the next 20 years. I'm I like something that works for two years and I know <laughs> I'm going to be tweaking it or yeah. adjusting it in some way. Nice. Nice. So curious if you're anything like me, I have now looked over and I'm actually starting to drop things off of my umbrella, my business model, because I recognized that I had overcomplicated my business, Dan. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever thought, hey, wait a second, we're a little too complex over here. Let's let that go and focus more energy in another direction, or are you just still in this building mode? No, I love looking at the, everything that I do is on the bubble. Now, particularly at the end of the year, you know, I like to have my goals set by November 15th. Mm -hmm. In that period of time, I'm also going to ruthlessly eliminate 15% of what I've been doing. I just ah. use it as an exercise because I want to look at what is the 15% that I've been doing that I'm going to remove. And sometimes those are very profitable, productive areas, but they aren't energizing me perhaps as much as I'd like. So that's how you make your decision is if yes. no, that doesn't give me energy, this does, I'm going to yes. focus. It over. So every year, 15%. Yes. Oh, I love that. <laughs> Talk about Which, continuous improvement and tell me the most painful thing to let go of. And, wh and what that means, incidentally, mathematically, that means every four years, I've got a new business. Now, that's not necessarily true. There are core components of my business that I had 30 years ago that I still have. But mm -hmm. it allows that fluidity and moving around, repositioning all the time. Yeah. I now, love that. I'm going to challenge our listeners to look at your business from the perspective every year of what can I let go of? And so what's the question, Dan? Is it, does this feed my soul? Does this bring me energy? Or does this suck the energy out of me? Yes. Is that a good question to ask? It, it is. And, and here's an example. I mean, I've done this for years. Yes. At one point, it was doing corporate seminars. Mm -hmm. They were very, very profitable for me. But my heart is with the entrepreneur. Right. It's not with big where you walk into a building, go up the elevator, the 13th floor, which there isn't one, of course, but anyway, go up there somewhere and into a conference room that's glassed in for the day. That really sucks the life out of me. So that was one time that was uh, several years ago, but like this last year, we have the 48 days, we, uh, the 48 days to the life, the, the work in life you love. 
And we have that in a seminar form. Mm -hmm. I really wanted to push getting that into the hands of individuals. So they would go through, we send them a box with the materials in there. And then I have 48 videos that are online that are part of that course. And I really wanted to push that. I found it extremely laborious to do that just one at a time like that. There wasn't much economy of scale, taking a lot of time and just frustrating me. Mm -hmm. like, you know what? I'm just going to move away from that, even though it really is a good application of my message. And I thought it would do more just on its own, but it just didn't. And so I said, you know what? I'm finished. Now I have thousands of boxes for that fancy seminar sitting in my warehouse. I'm going to recycle the cardboard. I, <laughs> I'm you know what? I'm just I, have, on. I have thrown away and I know our listeners can relate to this. So I wrote a book once called The Frog Whisperer about love and dating. And I had a journal and a CD and all this stuff. And I got to the end of writing the book and kind of starting to promote it. And I realized I don't want to be known for this. I, I it was completely off topic. It was just an idea that was in my head that I needed to get it out onto paper and into book form. But I didn't need to do all those extra things. Well, we just took them all to recycling. The whole works. I mean, I bet you, know. you I sold, you know, four journals. <laughs> and so if I bought 500, then 496 went to recycling. And I just, I, I, I have no problem. That, that didn't even pain me to just go, well, there we go. There's a lesson. There's a lesson. <laughs> and when I say pick a lane, I, I, I come to you from experience. I, I understand the pain of letting something go. And when you do that, then I'm sure you recognize new opportunities that were in your well house, that were in your lane, things that you could develop that you maybe didn't have time to because of that frog project you'd been working on. Yeah. I and mean, that's true for me. I mean, this last year in eliminating that, which if you look at it, just the the explosive possibilities. I mean, if we had 500,000 people buy that, it would have been very profitable. That didn't happen. Yeah. So for the ones that were trickling out, it was just like a, a constant reminder of the work that it took to do that. And I thought, what is it there that I can do that would have more leverage and be in an area that I enjoy more? So I went to the other end of my market so instead of somebody who just lost their job at Taco Bell and is trying to figure out how to get a job at McDonald's, I looked at, I already have people in my mastermind. They're very accomplished, successful entrepreneurs, and they're always, always looking for what's next. Now, a lot of them are real estate investors and they're invested in other kinds of things as well. But thought, you know what, what if we did something together? So I put together Eagles Innovation Group as a new company, a totally new company, and I allow those people who are members of my mastermind to be member investors in that. So they put in, I use my magic number 48. So it's $48,000. That's it. No more, no less. Everybody's the same. So we're all on equal footing. And then those people who are investors in that have an opportunity. Not only I make decisions about companies that we're going to invest in could be ideas, inventions. We've got a, well, we're vetting a new company tomorrow night, as a matter of fact, that we're looking at that I'm really interested in. And then those people have the opportunity, not only for the financial gain, but also to serve as a mentor in that company, mm. where we bring them in as a CFO or an interim CEO, or help with their marketing. So they can use their area of expertise in that company. So it's a more in interactive involved process than just opening your computer and buying a hundred more shares of Apple stock. Mm. So would you that call that like me. an angel investor group? Yeah, pretty much. It, we're, we're kind of like a shark tank. Yeah, that's so, so cool. And you can then see, that get your passion and your everything oh, that wow. has got you really jazzed, hey? Absolutely. That's oh. not like just more of the old stuff and trying to you know, tweak it a little bit. This is a totally new arena and I'm having the time of my life. Oh, that's fun. That's fun. Talk a little bit about moving. You decided that you had this big ranch in Tennessee and you were no longer able to do events there. So uh, what prompted you to move to Florida? So after the county showed up and said, slap my hand, <laughs> 
and said, you know, you ought to bulldoze your building. Incidentally, it took me four years, nine months, and three days to work through that bureaucratic process. And I finally got it totally approved. Mm. I think I just wore them out, but I got it totally approved. That's another story. But oh, yeah. because we couldn't do events there, all of a sudden it was just a big piece of property for yeah. my wife and I to take care of. It was just the two of us. Yes. We thought, wow, why are we doing this? Well, my wife has always loved Florida. We've been coming down to Florida for years, just on you know, various times we'd come down here. And she ultimately was asking the question, gee, why are we going back to Tennessee again? Mm. Well, being an author, speaker, coach, you know, we're pretty mobile. Wow. We can go anywhere, land anywhere. And I didn't have many excuses that I hadn't left. So we started exploring and being an old farm kid used to our property in Tennessee, you know, I like where there's green grass and big trees and winding roads and all that. And I thought, well, you can't do that in Florida. Everything's just sandbox, you know, brown grass and cookie cutter houses and you turn in and there's your garage. Well, we did some searching and discovered that's not true for every place in Florida. So we have a place with a big yard. There's a lake right behind with a golf course on the other side. So we have a beautiful, beautiful property that we're in and we just made the move. But, you know, there's something really refreshing about just kind of drawing a line in the sand and having something new. It forces you to reevaluate. How am I spending my time? Who who are we going to choose to spend time with? What kind of activities are we going to be committed to week after week where it's so easy just to kind of gravitate into those and have them build. We just keep, it's a garage. You keep throwing more and more in there. And when you move geographically, it really helps you to kind of take a new look. I love that process. So we're just south of Sarasota, Florida, right on the coast on the Gulf side. And it's very different. And we absolutely love it. My wife just says she pinches herself in the morning, make sure this isn't a dream. I love that. And I love that you just kind of, you've always evaluated and reinvented and then evaluated again and reinvented and I think that that is where, as we record this today, we're at the end of April and uh, COVID is kind of rearing its head again. I know that there's a lot of people who are just constantly evaluating, okay, is this what I want to be doing? You know, we just started speaking again and now maybe it might, you know, a few things might start to get bumped out and what have you. So maybe you don't want to be so dependent on the ups and downs of whatever's going on in the world or maybe you're totally maybe you just can't wait to get back on stage i think really understanding what it is that you truly truly love and makes you know feed your energy that's the thing we need to land on and here's the thing if somebody is waiting until we get back to normal Mm. waiting until things are the way they were, they're going to be disappointed because we're never going to go back to the way things were. The workplace has changed. This great resignation we talk about, yeah. you know, here in America, over 4 million people not resigning their jobs nine months consecutively. I mean, that is amazing. But unemployment is continues to drop dramatically. So it's mm-hmm. not like those people are just sitting on the curb somewhere doing nothing. Those people are saying, I didn't enjoy that. I'm going to go try this. We all have to be doing that. Mm-hmm. So what we're looking for, what are the new opportunities? Not how can I wait this out and get back to doing what I was doing? Before? What are the new yes. opportunities that I didn't see before, but now are showing up every day? There was one man who said to me, I don't know, we just had a quick intro chat or something. And he said, uh, well, my industry got dried up. And so I haven't done anything for two years. Oh. And I thought, oh, wow, well, all of our clients pivoted, got going, ramped up and evolved. And I mean, we were on it within a matter of days, days, maybe weeks for some people. But um, you've got to be able to, I mean, the waiting game, really, where does that take you? You're you're at somebody else's, everything, everything else now is in somebody else's control. Oh, it could seem that way if you allow it, that's for sure. But this last year, you know, a lot of changes. We made a lot of changes. You know, we moved, changed the business model and all that. 
and uh, just uh, took care of my taxes and <laughs> just showed my wife the check I had to write, and she was aghast. I says, well, you know what that means? It means we had the best best year we've ever had in our lives, for uh -huh. one thing. It uh -huh. just simply means that things are going very well for us. So we didn't just sit down and wait. We just simply you know, pivoted, re realigned, made the adjustments, and found new opportunities. That's what entrepreneurs do. I mean, that's what you know, speakers do. If somebody's a speaker, they certainly aren't looking just for a, a steady paycheck somewhere. They're innovative. They're thinking on their own. And we ought to be able to see those new opportunities. Yeah, and I just want to say uh, that we have a saying over here about not making decisions based on fear. I think when you start to see a few dates bumping out, fear can rear its head and you might start to scramble and make decisions that later on you may regret. So be aware we've been through this before <laughs> if if you know i don't think we're ever going to go back into shutdown but you're right dan things are never going to go back to quote unquote normal so just be aware of when fear is driving your feelings i'm pretty sure that you don't let fear drive uh very many of your decisions no no i don't <laughs> one of my <laughs> one of my pet peeves seeing people trapped in fear you know, fear means there's a lack of knowledge that you can overcome or perceive a lack of income to go in a new direction. And those things can be overcome pretty easily. But I, I had events booked at universities. That's one of the areas where I had a lot of opportunities to speak because we're helping kids understand the reality of the workplace out here, what they're going to be confronted with. Well, a lot of those got canceled, as, as you can expect. Mm -hmm. And they all expected that they would have me back when things got back to normal. Guess right. what? Those universities are finding out a whole lot of those kids that had to stay at home are not coming back to campus. Oh, I know that's happened up here too. One of uh, yeah. several of my friends work for the colleges and their, um, their enrollment is down like 20 plus percent. What do you, what do you attribute that to Dan? Just, just like the, the ordinary workers started working from home and all of a sudden they realized there's really no reason I can't work from home. Mm. And so when the company said, okay, we're ready for you to come back, they said, oh, no, count me out. I've got too many options. I can work for five companies doing exactly what I enjoy doing and do it from home and have fewer hours and double my pay. So the students are saying, you know what? If I really want to continue my education, I can jump online with any university out there but here's here's the other thing too, and this is a this is a new opportunity for me to help people understand this. There, Elon Musk just announced everybody, no surprise, you don't need a college degree to come work at Tesla. Guess mm -hmm. what? Neither do you at, at Microsoft, Google, Netflix. They're all saying we aren't really seeing a correlation between a four-year degree to help us identify the skills that we really need. Nice. So if you need especially in the tech world, there's a new term out there right now. It's called new collar worker or no collar worker. We used to identify, yeah, we used to identify people, you know, white collar worker, you know what that means? Somebody who's a banker or works in an office somewhere or a doctor, and then there's blue collar workers. Well, we don't have those distinctions anymore. There are people making $200,000 a year that wear a t-shirt, may not even go to an office, the no collar worker, but What's happened is those kids who used to be sitting in the university are discovering they can jump on LinkedIn learning and take a six week course and position them to get a hundred thousand dollar year position where the company doesn't care. They don't have a traditional four year degree. Well, that's a new opportunity for me because the workplace has changed. It's a new opportunity for me to speak both to universities and to those previous or prospective students, new opportunity. What are you uh, speaking to them on? For well, you, for the work you love. <laughs> well, in, in essence, that's still the core message. Yes. Yeah. But the application of that, see, changes. Right. 40 days of the work you love came out in 2000. Mm -hmm. 2000. That's a long time ago. I mm -hmm. updated every five years. Okay. So, with, so I updated in 05, 10, 15, and 20. 
Okay. But I've got voracious notes for what will be in the 2025 version. Yes. In, in this current version, about 30% of what is there was in the original version. Mm -hmm. So the original process of looking internally, that 85% of looking inward first has remained the same, pretty much so. The 15% is the application. Now that I know what I know about myself, how I relate to other people, what kind of environments are most comfortable in, what is the application? That has changed. 15 years ago, we didn't talk about electronic immigrants or digital nomads. Mm. We've got some of these terms that identify realistic work, but they don't have any of the characteristics of getting in your car, driving an hour commute, clocking in and sitting in a cubicle. None of that at all. So that's what I'm talking to schools about how to prepare students for the reality of the workplace. And then to students who are considering at least, what the options really are. That's cool. That is super cool. You're, you're dropping all kinds of interesting knowledge on us here. Mm -hmm. And I love it, Dan. Um, I just want to ask you a question. You know, you have all this confidence, you ooze confidence. Oh. And talk a little bit, go back in time, and you've called yourself a poor farm kid. Talk about how you learned to speak with such confidence and be confident in your ideas. Because honestly, I feel like that's kind of what we're in the business of selling here is confidence sometimes. It is. Oh, I love your question. Thank you. I was raised, yeah, I was poor. I remember when we bought one cow, Guernsey cow, we milked that cow by hand. And then we moved up to have 12 cows, still milking them by hand twice a day, 365 days a year. So we were very, very poor. And I grew up in that environment. Not only were we poor, Jane, but I was in a very, very restrictive, legalistic, theological, religious environment. My dad was pastor of a little tiny conservative Mennonite church. So we were not supposed to be interested in what's happening out there. Those people making money are probably cheating somebody and doing that. There's dangers in having a lot of money. You know, right. money's the root of all evil. Money is this, the root of all evil. That's right. And, and, and knowing what your money story is interesting, you know, is so interesting. And here, you know, that that's what you were raised on. That's what I was raised on. So it was not just an economic thing. It was an overlay of a cultural and theological thing as well to not have anything. I had too much time out in the fields by myself, I think, to think and dream and plan and imagine. And we did not have TV or radio in our house, but I had access to a little tiny country bookstore. And I would find these rags to riches stories in there. And I would find books like Think and Grow Rich. Uh -huh. Are you kidding me? That would be totally banned in my house. Oh, the yes. Magic of Thinking Big, David Schwartz. Those were the things that led to how I live and the confidence that I have today. It was those. David Schwartz, I mean, that little tiny book that I've read over and over again, Walk 25% Faster, you know, Smile Big, Remember People's Names, you know, Shake Hands. Those are the kind of things that have allowed me to overcome that shy, backward little boy that I was trained to be and to stay and just opened up world of opportunities. So a lot of it was in, in personal development to learn confidence, boldness, enthusiasm, and to share that. And wow, does that lead to opportunities? Oh, wow. I, I, did you have to leave your family and the church in order to kind of break free from that life? I did. I that did. Must been, now, that must have been a difficult decision at the time. It was. I'll give you the short version of that. My dad allowed me to go to school till I was 16. In our mm -hmm. culture, that was the model. Go to school as long as the state requires you to. And then at 16, you stop. My choices for work that I love were zero. Now, I was not only expected, I was obligated to just help my dad on a farm. He had fed me when I was a kid. My return payment was to work with him on the farm. So that was the model. So I did finish high school. Okay, allowed that. Then I wanted to go to college. Absolutely forbidden. I enrolled at Ohio State University, and I would go to night classes. So I would get up at 530 in the morning, milk the cows, do farm work all day long. And then at night, from 6 to 10 o'clock, I'd take night classes, much to my parents' 
this May. In that period of time, I also met Joanne when she was just 17. And so the 10 o'clock turned into 12 o'clock and one o'clock. Sometimes I'd come home, change clothes and go out and start the farm work. And oh I got God. sick. I got really sick. Mononucleosis, I couldn't get over it. Uh -huh. I was just deathly sick and realized the doctor told me I could not continue doing what I was doing. And I made a decision at 18 years old that I was not going to continue with my dad. That was a very, very painful time. No uh -huh. doubt about it. I left that I'm not going to help you anymore. Now, I'll be quick to add time is a wonderful healer. Yes. I got married to a woman they didn't approve of, but uh, Joanne, my wife, is impossible not to love her. Uh, she became my mom's very best friend. Aww. So they were certainly healing in that relationship. My dad, in, although he was used to the kind of work where you milk cows and take the milk to market, you plant corn and harvest the corn. He never really understood you talk and people pay you for that. No. He never could get his head around that. Corn. And I'm humbled, you know, now to realize that on a good day, I make more money than my dad ever made in a calendar year. Yeah. And he, he was real when he was even in the nursing home in his last years, you know, he was, he'd point me out on TV and he'd have my books in his room to show to his friends and all. So he was very, very proud of what I did and the impact he saw me having. But the transition time when I left the farm was very, very painful. No doubt. Wow. I think about my dad as well. And uh, the idea of making as much in a month or a day as he made in his entire mm -hmm. in his entire year. And he always laughed at me. Not only was he proud, Dan, but he would call me up and say, oh, it's Friday. Are you taking the day off? Because I said I wasn't going to work on Fridays anymore. And he thought that was hilarious. <laughs> and I was just happy to provide him. I always wanted to make my dad laugh. So uh, I made him proud and I made him laugh. Two yeah. boxes checked and, you know, probably like your dad. He's been gone for quite some time now. Yeah. Uh, uh, Dan Miller, it is always such an incredible pleasure to talk to you. Tell everybody if they want to know more about you, get involved in the 48 Days community. What's the what's the onboarding? How, how, how's the best place that they get to know you? Well, thank you. Well, the 48 Days is my consistent brand, so it's easy to find. 48days.com, a lot of resources there. The community that we have of people who are sharing ideas and want to grow their dreams to reality is the 48 Days Eagles. And again, if they just look for that, we use Eagles a lot in symbolism. Yes. I love the symbolism of the Eagles. So it's 48 Days sure. Eagles. These are people that are flying high. When there's storms, we just fly higher. And when oh. there are detractors, we fly high enough that they all fall away. I mean, there's so many things there, but those are a couple of places they could find more. Beautiful. Well, thank you, Dan. And Jen, who runs our school, has also uh, crossed into your community and actually introduced us to each other. Yeah. <laughs> She's introduced me to a lot of really cool people, and I'm so grateful that I got to know you and have had a chance to have you back on the show. Thank you again for being here, Dan. Well, thank you for having me as a guest, Jane. And for those of you tuning in, we appreciate you as well. And I cannot wait to see you again next week. With that, we will say, see you soon, multi-speakers. Bye for now.